a baby leopard seal there called Silas. And Silas is one of the stars of Ice Pups, mm. a new documentary following a pack of leopard seals over one Antarctic winter. Hydrogeleptonics, to use the Latin Ooh. term. I've yeah, done a little bit of reading, so... Someone's very keen. Yeah, well, I'm keen. I'm, I'm keen to give of my best. Here to tell us more about these mustachioed mammals is the show's creator, Alice Clunt. Welcome. Oh, it's Alice Fluck. Right, I see what I've done. <laughs> so, Alice, uh, this isn't your first time getting close to the animal kingdom, is it? Once upon a time, you were shortlisted in the Shell Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. Yeah, many moons ago, mm. yes. The oil company, Shell. They used to yeah. sponsor it, yes. yes. Well, do you know what? Good for them. I mean, you know, they get a lot of stick, don't they, for the Exxon Valdez oil spill, but then they sponsor a prize for animal photos, and you think, hmm, maybe it's time to take a fresh look at Shell. Uh, but tell us about ice pups, because leopard seal pups really are the most incredible animals, aren't oh, they? They really are, Jenny. I mean, what you see in the pups, and hopefully in the film, is their spirit and mm. their personality. Because, don't forget, these guys are living in the most inhospitable place in the whole world. Mm. You know, they are tough. You do not want to mess with a, with a leopard seal. Well over a <laughs> tonne, uh, teeth like giant daggers, top speed of 20 knots. A German U-boat commander would kill for velocity like that. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Well, what you see in the film, they do have this wonderfly playful mm. side as yeah. well. And yeah. how? They toss penguins around like a rag doll and batter them against the sea till they're dead. Just wait for it. For fun. Mm. Brutal. Mm. Well, they're, they're, they're mischievous, uh, certainly. And, and that comes from just being so intelligent. Well, the Allies train them to deliver mines strapped to their backs to scuttle enemy craft in harbour. Boom. Successful. We don't really touch on that on this film. This film is more about them in infancy and adolescence, and hopefully it's one the whole family can enjoy. Aww. Aww. Wrong tone. Wow, they're plucky little so-and-sos, though, aren't they? They have to be. You know, they're only weaned for a month, oh. and then it's up to them to fend for themselves. Oh, breaks your heart, doesn't it? <laughs> when you're around them such a long time, it, it is hard not to get attached. Oh. Oh, I think I'm a bit in love. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Bless them. Oh. They're the most adorable little creatures. Mm. They seem to have such personality. You almost want to give them a name. Well, don't th you? This one's called Silas. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I know. I mean, a better one, though, like Richard. Oh, I don't know whether to eat him up or wear him. Do you know what I mean, though? I suppose Eskimos do both. Well, you find leopard seals in the Antarctic. Falklanders, then. Now, Alice, uh, the film ends with the sound of a seal cry, and it's quite a sound, isn't it? <laughs> uh, actually, let's hear it. Not a sound you forget. No. <laughs> when I heard that, I had an overwhelming sense of Gary Newman. And you know the other musician I was thinking of? Don't know why. Seal. I do know why. Uh, it it's almost sounds sort of philosophical, doesn't it? Yes. I don't think that's the right word, Jenny. I think it's remindful. It uh, reminded me of my granddad. Did it? Yeah. He made funny noises and he had whiskers and he liked fish. Mm. He was a smashing granddad. One of my earliest memories, actually, is him uh, taking me to the fun fair, and me asking for a candy floss, and then eventually he gave in and got me one, and took me home, uh, said goodbye, but left his hat. And when I ran to the bus stop, uh, he wasn't there. And I saw he was walking up the hill. That's when I realised he'd spent his bus fare on my candy floss. Grandad Graham. Grandad. And you can see the whole of Alice's film on BBC One tomorrow night. Alice Clunt. Fluck. Fuck. Fluck. Thank you very much for joining us. So, th so rare birds' eggs are being scrambled for Russian oligarchs, and Bill Oddy goes ape shit. He shows up at Claridge's wearing his twitchers jerkin, and the pockets are full of every conceivable explosive. I got the picture. He walks in to the uh, buffet area, the breakfast buffet. People turn round, they say, isn't that the man from Springwatch? Someone else says, one, wasn't he once one of the goodies? Yeah, not anymore, now he's a baddie. Seconds later, carnage. Oddy is like a bearded Catherine wheel scything through the crowd. Ironically, so the, the oligarchs wearing the leather jackets are protected from the worst of the blast, but a, an innocent couple from the northeast <sighs> on a city break are vaporised. Sorry, are you, are you asking me a specific question? Yes. And that question is, is if, if an RSPB yeah. 
neo-fundamentalist, yeah. was radicalised. Yeah. Uh, Oddie uh, sacrificed himself. Yeah. And the, the rest of them holed up in Wookiee Hole and I was sent to neutralise the threat. Yeah. How would I proceed? Simples. Uh, really want to know? Yeah, yeah, let's hear it. Like hand to hand combat, com commando style. Do you mind if I stand up? No, please. Take the floor. Take the floor. The floor is yours. You have right. the floor. So, in uh, Special Forces, we're, we're given license to use bespoke techniques, improvised weaponry, that sort of thing. Uh, my favourite for hand to hand combat is this brass knuckle which I've adapted. I've stuck a protruding blade on one side, very sharp. And what I would do is, I'd, uh, when I'd attack the first insurgent, punch him full in the face as hard as I could until I felt a splinter of bone, that his nose was truly shattered. And then, as he's toppling backwards, grab hold of him with your right hand and bring my hand back with the blade like an arc across his throat, severing one or preferably both of the carotid arteries. It's, you've got to be careful here because you've got to avoid the squirt of the jet of blood because, you know, you don't want to be blinded moving on to the next fella. It's, it's quite weird, this, actually, because uh, if you get it right, the, the neck opens up completely, yawns back like a Muppet's mouth. Oh, my God. So then you let them drop, <laughs> take care not to trip over them. I've seen that happen. And then you repeat and adapt, 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 until the cave is clear. It's very bloody, but it's quick and it's quiet. And that's why I like it. Any questions? No. Yeah, um... A witch muppet. You rejoin us on Mid Morning Matters. Tommy Gaskell, survival expert, still with us. And on lie two, we have Sophie. Sophie, what's your tongue twister? No, love, he didn't hurt any Muppets. He simply dispatched um, some uh, terrorists from a radicalised RSPB in, in Wookie Hole. Uh, it was simply that when he slit the throats of the bad people, they resembled the mouths of Muppets. Hope that answers... Did they get better? Did they get better? We cleared the cave. No. No, no-one survived, Sophie. He cleared the cave. Did you feel bad? It's my job. No, he didn't feel bad, Sophie. Welcome back. Tomorrow, our focus is on teenage angst and the troubling issue of self-harm. Oh, well, that's a tough issue, actually. The closest I've ever come to self-harm, I guess, would be I used to pluck nasal hairs when I was angry with myself after a show had gone badly. Sometimes poke my skin with one, I think. That would make a good sword for an ant. But today, we look at youth unemployment, a trend that has caused particular decay among Scottish inner cities. And yet I know, anecdotally, from friends with large gardens that Scottish people can make great workers. It's a shame. We're joined on the sofa by Dale Daniels, himself long-term unemployed, who now campaigns to improve prospects for Scottish youth. Dale, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hi. Now, you're furious, aren't you? Even for a Scot. Well, so should everyone be, huh? And Absolutely. Got, hmm? A so-called developed nation. You know, letting kids rot away in these estates, huh? Indeed. When I grew up... Hmm? I thought you were... Please. Well, when I grew up, there was industry, there was factories, and shipbuilding in the Clyde, you know, work if you wanted it. That, that's not there anymore, huh? And Absolutely. Then, what? Sorry. So what happens? You know, I mean, kids fall into a cycle of crime and, and we lay the blame at them. But we did that, huh? You don't agree? No, I do. So how do we get out of this vicious cycle? Is it education, training? Aye, but it's bigger than that, eh? Eh. It's, you know, it's about seeing the world from, well, from their point of view, huh? No. Uh. You know, we close down Sure Start and, and football pitches and youth centres and you... You wonder why the kids get any bother, huh? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if you have any kids, huh? Eh. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh. Well, uh, I've got a 13 year old, yeah, and that's why I'm saying to the government, all you're doing is building problems for the future, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's amazing uh, because 
weirdly, what you're saying actually makes sense. Eh? Mm? Aye. Aye. Good. Good. Jemmy, Jenny. Well, thank you so much, Dale Daniels. Finding the time to stay in shape isn't easy. I donned my sweatbands and leotard to find out how one street in Walsall are getting in shape. <laughs> I love that advert. What, 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 give them, them away. away. OK, time for some more calls on... What is Alan firing his friend's air rifle into? That sound again. And again. Line 10, what am I firing my friend's air rifle into? A sandwich. Uh, wrong, line 3. The future? <laughs> Are you on an E? <laughs> Line six. Don't know. Did you call earlier? Yeah, I did. Unbelievable. Uh, line four. Chop, chop, the nurse is here. <laughs> what, the, what's, what the hell's all that about? <laughs> no idea, mate. <laughs> Seriously? <what? laughs> might, might have something to do with me. Why? It's uh, to do with something I did on the uh, on Branning show last night. <laughs> Well, let's hear it. Move let, on, move on. No, let's hear move it. Move on. Let's hear it. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, it wouldn't work now. No, nah, you work. can't deprive the listeners of mid-morning matters. On, on this occasion, I think I, I think I should. <laughs> Seriously, let's hear what you did. Really? Yes. Yeah, yeah. OK, uh, well, um, so... Uh, Carl, so Carl Branning was under the weather and he... Um, he had some night nurse and some uh, day nurse. And so the big joke was, you know, what... Which one should he take? Because it's the night time, but he still didn't want to go to sleep. And then the callers started. It's like a, the late at night. The callers are a bit more sort of uh, zany. So they start calling in and uh, with the other suggestions for nurses and people. And anyway, the point was someone called in about a mental nurse, and then I had to. I basically was then a mental nurse for the for the next hour, just doing a you know stupid character about this um, about this nurse who kind of scuttles around the wards and is like putting milk into the drips and things and she's just um like toppling people out of uh out of beds and i don't really Psychic Simon, Psychic Simon. Oh, don't worry about it, I'll say. Wait a minute. Have you seen Duck Soup and Mark's Oh, yeah. You, you, you'd love that. OK, time for traffic and travel. Traffic and travel. That was Alison Moye again. And now for the final choice cut of Partridge on Partridge. <laughs> Sounds like two birds copulating. Not now, mate. What about family? Got any kids? Yeah, I got a couple, male and female. Names? Denise, she's the female, and Fernando, he's uh, the other one. Love them? Just a bit. Do they listen to the show? <laughs> yes, they do. It's not what they told me. You, you don't know. What would be you know your ideal them. evening? I'll Alan. tell you what it wouldn't be, he's having a pint of bitter with a traitor. Oh, come on, Alan, give me a break. Who said I was talking about you? The world doesn't revolve around no, you. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> You're not the moon. Yeah, I thought you said you weren't bothered. What about your favourite TV show? Deal or no deal, I'm not bothered. And why is that? Edmunds. You know, you can do what you like for all I care. It's a free country, unless they change the law. What about a favourite war? The Hundred Years. I'll tell you something else. Any reason? Pioneering use of cannons. You can make love to the guy for all I care. You know, bum time with Branning. You know, that's been legal since 67. What's your greatest yeah, You give a break to uh, a, a lab assistant from uh, Secondary Modern. Your biggest weakness? Rep repays you by taking 30 pieces of Branning silver. He's not paying me, Alan. It's a, it's a metaphor. What makes you laugh? Uh, to recap... Key strength, courage, weakness, too kind, funny, YouTube, sneezing panda, enjoy chat. I enjoyed chatting to you too, thanks, Alan. And tell Chegman I'll pay for the dry cleaning, but he should oh, count himself something lucky, else. And the answer to what is Alan firing his friend's air rifle into is a beef tomato. And here is Mick Harknell. But first, how many of you out there are 100 years old? More than you might think. National statistics say there are 14,000 centenarians in the UK. And that's enough to fill the Birmingham arena. Wow. Yeah, although presumably they need a lot more toilets. The latest addition to that exclusive 100 Club received her telegram from the Queen this very morning. And as her granddaughter writes, she's a big fan of this show. Oh, here's what she wrote. 20 seconds. Where's my fucking water? I made it very clear I need a glass of water after exercise or else white saliva forms at the corners of my mouth. Well, whose is this? That's mine now. Careful, it's fizzy. What? And I'm delighted to say Rose Haig joins us on the line now. Rose, are you there, my love? Well, of course I'm here. Where else would I be? Rose, many congratulations. 
Excuse me. <coughs> Congratulations. <coughs> Hello? <coughs> there we go. Rose, can you tell us where... No, leave it here. Here. Because if you leave it there, I can't reach it, you stupid girl. Rose, I believe your father was a, a captain now, stationed course, in the I army. I grew up in the Reich, 1930. Yes. Mm. It's perfectly pleasant. Uh, one can be rather misty-eyed. Uh, uh, of course, the hangover was rather botched. Mountbatten did what he could. Poor old Dickie, Ratchet. That's lovely. I was just wondering, wondering about uh, the secret to your old age. I'm talking, young man. <laughs> You Sorry. normally interrupt people when they're speaking. I've been called a young man for quite some time. Stop mumbling. Why are you staring at me? What's your name? I'm a portrait. The point being, we had a houseboy. Not a friend, you understand, an right. employee. Okay. He used to run errands, <laughs> and we called him Brownie. Right. Not the sharpest of fellows, but curiously, he was not an Indian. Okay. He was a Negro. And they are very different because uh, whilst physically stronger, they. Oh, oh right. dear! Uh, we seem. Right. Oh, we seem to yeah. be. We seem to have lost Rose there. But yes, a great achievement and a colourful character. Yeah. Different times, different times, and uh, apologies there for the wind and the racism. Alan, we're back on. With respect, Councillor, I think our listeners will be more concerned about cuts to public services. It, well, absolutely, Terry, and that's why we've set out proposals Terry, to ensure... let me take it from here, throw me the ball. Councillor, you talk a good game. I caught it, by the way. Um, but I have figures that show that you plan to cut public spending. Are you talking about the raw figures or the figures adjusted for inflation? Yes. Well, the, the first or the second? The first, the first, the first, the first, right, the first, well, for God's sake. In that case, that that's wrong, because if you right. look at the figures, the actual spend has remained the same as last year, see? Yeah. No, I understand it. I'm just, mm. uh, just checking it. Well, it's there. Yeah. Mm. That's fine. The, uh, another area where we've seen a, a great deal of public anger is in council housing. Mm. Now, mm. what is the proposal here? Well, I, mean, I meant the second, sorry. I meant, the se I meant the second one. What? When, you, when you gave me the choice before. I meant the, I meant the, the second cho choice where the figures are adjusted for inflection. Well, Alan, we've made no secret of the fact that we're not going to keep pace with inflation. In fact, it's inflation. one of the few issues that we have cross-party agreement on, so... Um, right. We've made no secret of the fact that we're bus, going bus, to have bus, to make... Bus fares! I'm sorry? Bus fares. Have you not put up bus fares? As we said in our manifesto, we won't be putting up bus fares in any... Ha, have you put up bus fares? Not in real terms. Have you put up bus fares? In line with inflation, we have had to keep pace... Yes or no? Have you put up bus fares? In our manifesto... Have you... Have you... Have you put up bus fares? We've only put up bus fares. Have you put up... Bus fares. Yes, but only yes, in as but much... Yes, but you, yes, but you, yes, but yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you. If you want to see that interview back online and see me getting a politician to admit something slightly different from what they said earlier and then no, saying, look, you said something slightly different from what you said earlier. No, and that, And uh, so, one nil. It's 10am. It's just after 10am. You have been listening to Alan Partridge with special guest Tory Bronwyn, Matthews... Who's... Tory councillor Bronwyn Matthews. Yeah, her, and what's your name? Terry Cohen. Terry Cohen. Uh, get well soon uh, to uh, Eddie Shadow. Shepherd. Uh, who I'm sure will get well uh, very soon. Uh, that's rhetoric, not a prognosis. Uh, right now, you're listening to Mid Morning Matters with Alan Partridge. See ya. Take a cup of personality, pour in some chat... And drink up some good company. I.e. mid-morning matters with Alan Partridge. Good evening, uh, morning, afternoon. Who cares? Who gives a flying monkey? Because uh, today we're talking about things you don't see much of 
any more. Uh, already we have uh, capes, tinned meat, Horlicks, sparrows, hula hoops, the crisps, not the toy, uh, hula hoops, the toy, not the crisp, uh, swimming pools with deep ends and asbestos. Um, uh, we'll be asking, should we bring some and or all of them back? So do please text, uh, Twitter, spam, fax, page, write and or email. And here is the woman herself to tell us more about her new series that shines a light on women in science. It's writer and broadcaster Dee Gilhooley. Uh, just to clarify, by the way, some viewers may mistakenly think that your second name is Hooley and your first name is Deagle. In actual fact, your second name is Gil Hooley, your first name is D. That's a full name, not an initial. Yeah. Welcome. Wicked to be here. Cool. So you're perhaps best known as one of the regulars on Radio 4's Woman's Hour. Which, by the way, guys, well worth a listen. Oh, I wouldn't have had you down as a fan, Alan. Well, it's, an, it's a curious story. I was actually uh, stuck in traffic and Classic FM were playing music from an advert which I dislike. So I found myself listening to Woman's Hour and I thought, this is actually good. <laughs> tell your friends. I did. I told ten men and they will tell ten men and they will tell ten men to tell ten men to tell ten men. It sounds like the kind of song you'd sing on a coach trip, but it's actually true. Now, your radio series focuses on trailblazers and groundbreakers in the field of science. Bang on, yeah. It's a chance for some brilliant, lesser-known women to have their stories told, you know what I mean? So, uh, with all due respect to your Ada Lovelaces or Rosalind Franklins, we're going to be looking at women under the bonnet, as it were, um, the fuel in the turbocharger. Because there's some fascinating women here. We're talking Vera Rubin, Nettie Stevens, yeah. Cecilia Payne. I mean, brilliant women. Oh, kick-ass women. Yeah, Cecilia Payne's actually is an amazing story. A British astronomer got her doctorate at 25. Boom. <laughs> and she wrote a paper on the composition of the stars, but was persuaded not to publish it by her colleague, Henry Norris Russell. Years later, her findings were published and credited to... You've guessed it. Henry Norris Russell. Bingo. Are you still with us, Alan? The, yeah. So I'm sorry to... Actually, it makes me physically sick to say this, but I was miles away. Which shows this is a real problem within men, isn't it? Um, what I will say, the purposes of clarification, is um, you don't put fuel in the turbocharger. It's a small turbine housed within the exhaust that utilises excess gases, loops them back round, increases power output. So small capacity engine, big hike in power very efficient. That was told to me by an engineer in oily overalls called Karen. Woman. Fair play. Yeah. <laughs> well, because women in jobs like that have to put up with their fair share of jeering, you know, even now in 2018, and they just have to accept it. If I can just speak as a male, I am sorry, I have sinned. I've stood on the pavement with other men and slow hand clapped as I watched a woman try to parallel park. And that's wrong. Um, I, I think if I saw the same thing happen today, I would just, you know, shout out instructions. Or just leave her alone. Yeah, I'd shout out instructions or just leave her alone. I'd ask her which she prefers. Or just leave her alone. Or just leave her alone. Yeah. These issues need to be aired by women. We're still seeing powerful men harassing women when all they want to do is do their jobs and be left alone. Amen. <laughs> hey, women. I mean, I, I, I feel you, I feel you. I don't, I don't mean I feel you, I wouldn't do that unless I was your, your doctor or your boyfriend. But I totally identify with what you're saying. Well, I, I think the Me Too is a woman thing, yeah, really, exactly. isn't it? I mean, I'm not sure yeah. it's that helpful for a man to presume <laughs> to know what that's like, to be honest, but anyway. Of course it is. Yes. It, you know, if men actually listened to what women were saying on mm. harassment, then they'd shut up and listen, <laughs> but they don't. You know, so we're still seeing the same things time... I've been yeah. sexually harassed. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware. It's not quite the same thing that women have been through, but uh, it is a bit. Uh, so, a quick email here from Samantha, who says that she has fat arms. Oh, oh, Samantha. I mean, a lot of people, so many of you, have a fixation with physical perfection these days. It's because we're bombarded with images of size absolutely. zero models, an impossible ideal to attain. It is, abso absolutely. Uh, Samantha, I'm sure, I'm sure your arms are absolutely fine. She's, um, well, she's got an attachment here. So, oh, my God, they are vast. Th wow, Alan. that's. Uh, you've got a lovely face, Samantha. She's got a, she's got a lovely face. Yeah. 
Uh, I've got to send this to Jonathan Ross. OK, and, uh, yeah, we've got a letter here from Lucinda. Uh, Lucinda says, I'm 45, but I'm going out with a 23-year-old man. Um, we clicked straight away, but although he's very affectionate, we are yet to make love and he cannot maintain an erection. And I'm worried it's my fault. What shall I do? Well, it's actually very common in younger men, much more so than people realise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, 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 these young men look all well and good uh, in the underpant adverts, <laughs> but uh, when it come, when they hit the hay... It's failure to launch. That, yeah, I like yeah. it. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, come in here. What do, what do young women make of it all these days? Mm. Um, well, I suppose... I suppose it comes down to confidence, really, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Because I think a younger man can be a bit yeah. too eager to please yeah. and end up sort of at sixes and sevens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but And then a, an older man, you know, with some experience, is perhaps a bit more at ease with himself. Yeah. 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 And, of course, we're very fortunate these days. We have Viagra. Yeah, but although do not exceed the state of dose. So uh, you, you've suffered from that, have you, Alan? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Well, a, a lot of men have. I mean, it's nothing to be ashamed of. All right, what, all right, all right, once. But that was only because I had already commenced foreplay when I remembered uh, I hadn't renewed my tax disc. But um, once I put a quick call into the DVLA, uh, lovemaking could begin in anger. I think it's all about making sure the conditions are right, mm. getting the mood right, the atmosphere. Oh, sure. Mm. I mean, I'm not going to. I'm. I'm. I'm not going to be embarrassed about this. Seeing, seeing as we're being trying to be, you know, grown up about this. There, there, there have been times when I've been more uh, rubbery than turgid. I mean, you can't just summon up uh, tumescence like room service. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think it's it's partly down to the woman to sort of help help set the mood a little, Absolutely. help man relax. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's all about mood. Uh, take the phone off the hook. Mm -hmm. uh, put on some easy listening, Carpenters, Enya, and of course, make sure the heating's on. Okay, uh, got another email here from uh, from Paul in Swatham on forced celebrity breeding. Um, this one is Kylie Minogue and David Dickinson to make an umpa lumpa. Absolutely. Uh, Minogue provides the size, Dickinson provides the requisite skin tone and expression. <laughs> Let's have some Alison Moyer. Hilary Couchman, Dr Hilary Couchman. How long have you been swearing? Well, curse words or vulgarities go back really as far as language itself, but when it comes to written English, we find profanities cropping up from the 13th century. So. Something like this. Should I wear gloves to handle this? The protocol is that the curator handles the material. Oh, OK. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure I've seen Dr David Starkey handling stuff like this on TV. And I've even seen them let Tony Robinson have a fiddle. The protocol is the curator handles the material. You said that. Do they ever let you guys go to an area just to relax? Because they, they should do. Maybe that should be part of the protocol. Swearing, swear words. One of the more prominent words is the word f but c too is also common across the Germanic and Scandinavian languages. Yeah. We also find uses of piss, c c well, shit, c c well, what, what, where, where, what areas would these profanities emanate from? I'm thinking Manchester, Liverpool. No, from across the whole country. OK. Now, what we have here are parish records from Drayton in Shropshire. Uh, when would that be? 1295. That's what these trousers cost. So, what these documents show is how the earliest instances of swear words were typically found in the names of places or people. Mm -hmm. So, surnames often describe what someone was or did. Right. Here we have a listing for um, Henry a beggar. Goodness me. Now, back then, the word f didn't have its current meaning. Okay. It actually referred to hitting or striking. Right, good. Uh, well, hence the phrase, let's hire some Albanians to f him up. So there are terms that have fallen out of use. So here in 1740, uh, we have the term rantalian, oh, which means one word. whose scrotum is so relaxed as to be longer than his penis. One wonders whether that's due to a truncated member or a distended testes. Well, I guess it's just chicken and egg. 
Um, we also find some fairly vulgar slang words for penis, such as beard splitter mm -hmm. and arse opener, whilst fellatio was known as bagpiping. Oh, makes sense. In the 1785 book, The Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, mm -hmm. we find the term to huffle. Would you like to have a guess at what that means? Oh, gosh, I'll have a bash. Um... Uh, to huffle um, the act of putting my head between a lady's breasts and uh, huffling. That's, you get the picture. No, it's, it's another word to fillet. <laughs> right, OK. I always find it amusing uh, when I ask people that question, what answer I'll get. <laughs> right, well, that's an interesting part of the protocol. Um, thank you very much, Dr Hilary Mantel. Couchman. Well, one who likes to squat over... Another it's my surname. Right, yes, of course.